text this morning will come from Hebrews chapter 2. And as I'm studying through this letter to the Hebrews, really a, a sermon as I've called it, I've thought more and more about the name Jesus. We know the second member of the Trinity, Jesus, because of his incarnation. God with us, his name is Jesus. There's a special focus of his humanity. And we have solidarity with him because he has lifted us up. Remember a few weeks ago here in chapter 2, a quotation of Psalm 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Sorry for the King James, I had that memorized that way. But in the text here, in verse 6 of Hebrews 2. But note here, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. This is a temporary condition, the state of mankind in general. But it goes on to contrast, you have crowned him with glory and honor putting everything under subjection under his feet. But, but that's not the way it is right now. This comes through the incarnation of Christ by which mankind, for those that have repented and believed and are trusting in Christ, will be lifted up. They'll be crowned with glory and honor. No wonder it would be futile just to be working for yourself and temporary things that may be of some benefit for a little while. But we're talking about those that are in Christ will be, ground, will be crowned with glory and honor because Christ is crowned with glory and honor. But there's going to be a shift a little bit here in the preaching of chapter 2. Because now the focus, and I'll probably repeat it again, it's going to focus in this incarnation of Christ, his name Jesus, not so much in the lifting up of mankind, but in the lowering himself to be in communion with mankind, solidarity with Jesus, as I've called it. It's, it's Jesus determining to lower himself, to be in union with mankind. It'll be a little clearer, I hope, as we unfold this text. We're going to root this morning in verse 11. It points to this solidarity that Jesus has with us. Notice, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified. The, the one who sanctifies, obviously, is Jesus. And the ones that are sanctified are those that are in Christ. And they all have one source, it says. This branches out then in the next two verses here, talking about then the benefits that we have because of our solidarity with Jesus. It is what he has determined to have with his people. In verse 12, it's, it's going to focus on the, the actual friendship now that we have with God. Quotation from Psalm 22. In verse 13, it, it will emphasize that, that uh, fellowship now that we have with God through Christ. And then finally, it'll talk about those that are in Jesus and that he has solidarity with. He is then their family, a family of brothers. Both of those last two, fellowship and family, come from Isaiah 8, primarily. These benefits that we have are granted to us solely by faith. And it is only to those who are indeed sanctified. That's verse 11. Not everyone has this friendship with God, this fellowship with God, this family relationship with God and intimacy here. It is for those that are sanctified, 
who are set apart for that, verse 11. The, those that are sanctified are the sons, notice verse 10 in chapter 2. They're the sons that are brought to this glorified state, crowned with glory and honor by Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who experiences eternal death, that penalty. He tastes death for every one of these sons, every one of these sons whom he sanctifies and enables them to be crowned. This final state of the believer is called a state of glorification. This is accomplished by none other than God incarnate, Jesus. Do you know him? And what he does is so grand, it's so great, it's called here in our text a, what, great salvation, verse 3. It's, it's immense, it's massive, bigger and greater than anything that you could possibly imagine. In order for those that are the sons who are sanctified, in order for that to occur, for those benefits to accrue, Jesus had to take on human flesh, and that's part of his argument here being made lower, and yet he is higher. He had to take on human flesh. We call that the incarnation, where God stoops down to literally walk in our shoes, to experience what we experience experientially, not just to know about it, but to actually experience suffering from the very smallest to the greatest, Ultimately, death, which is a result of suffering, the culmination of it. He suffered and died for those who had their faith in him. This is a great and immense salvation because ultimately it is about putting on display the various attributes of God, not limited to grace, mercy, forgiveness, kindness, compassion, and we could go on. This great salvation, as we talked about last week, it is fitting. That is, it accords with, it is becoming, if you will, of God, verse 10. Because to, in order to, to save and crown with glory mankind, he just couldn't pretend that those sin didn't exist. You would have a complaint at, from many, but at, the very chief would be the accuser of the brethren. No one's going to get away with murder. No one is going to get away with being unjust. All certainly have sin and fall, fallen short of God's glory, Romans 3.23. But those that are in Christ are justified by his grace, which is a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is Christ Jesus who accomplishes and earns that redemption, whom God put forward as the propitiation for our sin by his blood to be received in faith. This propitiation is a big word. Think of it as just payment or covering, the, the resolution. If the wages of sin is death, you see Christ died. That's the point. And how will it be received? It will be received by faith, by trust in him. It was to show, Paul would say further in Romans 3.25, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. The, from the beginning of time, Adam, th there's a sense in which he, it was covered, but not completely. In God's forbearance, he completely atones for it in the death of Christ. All that preceded that just simply pointed to 
the object of their faith. It is Jesus Christ who would actually experientially pay and atone for sin. And this accomplishes that which is in accordance or fitting, as the preacher of Hebrews says, with the very righteousness of God. Because then, as Paul would say in 326 of Romans, it was to show his righteousness at this present time so that he might be this, just, that is, he's going to be righteous, and also justifier, declare someone who is not just as just, the justifier. And who is that one? It is the one who has their faith in Jesus. That's a great salvation. Should respond in great praise. He took on his body, our sin, and atoned for them. But that's not all he did in this incarnation. In atoning for our sin, which allows us then to be in the very presence of of God, no longer guilty. In this incarnation, and this is where he's going here in verse 11 and following, this is going to bring about a new relationship that those who are in Christ have with God because of not just our desire to have union with him, but his desire to have union with us. His solidarity, an eternal kinship, a unique relationship in which the holy God now declares us to be friends. He invites us to have fellowship with him. And he will treat those that are in Jesus as beloved family. We'll unpack that to some degree from our text. Let me just read that aspect of it, 11 through 13, and then we'll unpack where we're going with this. Verse 11, chapter 2. Pay close attention a lot here. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Notice, this is in the voice of Jesus. This I, I, and I. Let us pray. Oh, Father, may we indeed hear the desire of Jesus to have solidarity with us. May it be beyond that which just humbles us, but calls us to have great joy, confidence, and assurance in you. May we hear, indeed, what Jesus would say to each of us this day. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. This doctrine that is taught in verse 11 is very significant. I'll just touch on a couple things. Notice here it says that about this one source. Those that are sanctified is, are sanctified by the sanctifier. And there's one source, a single source. That's how it's translated in the ESV. If you have the King James or the New King James, it'll, it'll say, instead of one source, it'll say um, all of one. In the NIV, it says of the same family, and the New American Standard, it says all from one father. Family and father are not here in verse 11. It's supplied, neither is this um, uh, source mentioned either, because this is a difficult phrase to translate. And so the translators are trying to help us 
And they're, they're not wrong here because you have father and family mentioned in the context of the text. But that's not what's literally here. What's literally here is that it, it says that those that are he who sanctifies and those that are sanctified literally uh, would be from one all. Well, that doesn't work that well in English. From one all. What is, what is meant here? Generally, God, of course, would be that source from one all. Specifically, it points to Jesus, the incarnate one. The point really being made here is that there is a solidarity, this oneness, all from one, or one from all. A solidarity between those that are sanctified, note that, and the sanctifier. The sanctifier is Jesus Christ. He's the God-man who comes down from heaven to make propitiation for our sin. Notice verse 3. This is, as I opened with, this is Jesus' solidarity with his people. This is his condescension to come to us to then be one of us. That's an amazing thing when you think about God who is now involved with his people and has a solidarity with him. The second thing I wanted you to notice here, doctrinally, I'm just going to try to be brief, but it says, uh, it says this word sanctification. I've repeated it a number of times. The, the word could be just translated Hagayazo, it could be just translated holy, made holy, set apart, set apart by something that is specific. The sanctifier, of course, is Jesus. The sanctified are the sons that he's going to bring to glory. And how are they set apart? How are they made holy? Hebrews 10.10 helps us. They're sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That, that's how you will be holy, sanctified, and set apart by God. It is through Jesus Christ who died one time. 13.12 of Hebrews says about Jesus suffering, taking on this suffering. Why did he do it? To sanctify the people through his own blood. This sanctifier is Jesus Christ. The result of it is that he would make those sons perfectly holy and righteous before God. As we demonstrated in our communion earlier, it's Jesus who bore the penalty of our sin, the guilt, and beyond that, he also merited the righteousness that is required to stand before God in perfect holiness. I've said this before, but I like to repeat sometimes. If someone actually asked you, which they won't, why should I let you into my heaven? I would say, look at him. And I hope that's your heart as well. Not, not I've, I've done pretty good and, and better than most, but no. You would look to the perfectly righteous one and be clothed in his absolute righteousness. If you're reading through the New Testament epistles, letters to the churches, you'll find, by the way, that the Apostle Paul is going to address those members of the church, just common members of the church. He uses a word for them that quite often he calls them saints. It's the same word here. It's holy one. We don't use that term much. It's been perverted by Rome as if there's a special class of people who somehow merited more righteousness than somebody else. Can I tell you, all of their righteousness is as filthy rags. There's only one who is perfectly righteous. It is this Jesus, and anything less than that is absolute blasphemy. We can call ourselves, however, holy ones, not in our pride, not in our accomplishment, not in our merit, but in that which has been given to us in Christ. And for Christian. That's a great blessing. 
to be thinking about the holiness that is granted to you in Christ. You're absolutely perfect, righteous before God because of Jesus. No wonder there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Those that are then holy, made holy by Christ, who are set apart and will be holy as they will stand before him in absolute glory, crowned with glory because he will lift them up. Christ comes down now to have a special and unique relationship with each one of his sons and daughters. This relationship, as I alluded to, is going to be a unique relationship where Jesus... God incarnate desires to be a friend of sinners and make them saints. He has a great delight and joy to actually fellowship with us. The God of all creation would take on human flesh so that he can be among brothers, family. What a great truth. Let's look at each one. He will say, this is God incarnate, Jesus, through this sanctification, setting apart to make holy, that creates a unique state in which Verse 11, he says, that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Who? The sons who are sanctified. He's not ashamed. Why? He says that's why. Well, what's that's why? Well, that's the first part of the verse. For he who sanctifies and those that are sanctified all have one source. This is the, the unity then where the, those sinners are brought and sanctified and in union now with the sanctifier, they are then made holy. Now, given our natural state of rebellion, and even as we struggle as redeemed people who still wrestle with those remains of sin until were fully glorified in his presence that we would think that perhaps we would bring a lot of shame to Jesus. Have you felt that way? I wish I didn't do that. He's going to be ashamed of me. You have family members that you're ashamed of? Friends, acquaintances? people that you no longer talk about because you're ashamed of them, what they've done. And some of it you can't get away from because, you know, how's your brother doing? Oh, well, he's in jail. Those that are in union with Jesus now have a new relationship and we'll call it positionally but it will work out practically in eternity and from that perspective this new relationship with God shame all shame is removed by Jesus Christ Let's look at a text in Ephesians chapter 2. Because I'd like for you to see it and recognize where you have been and where you are and all through the incarnation of the Son. That's what he's getting to in Hebrews here. This is about Jesus, the incarnate one. In in chapter 2 in Ephesians, our condition before God, the 
since the fall, a, a natural state, if you want to think of it that way, or a default state, that you are dead in trespasses and sin. A dead man walking, if you will, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that would be the devil, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's the default state. Th that's how you're walking in disobedience, and ultimately, maybe not overtly in your thoughts, but ultimately it is not living to the glory of God. And this is the condition of all of us, verse 3. We all once lived this way in the passion of our flesh. That is, we're coming to life from our own narcissistic expressions. We're, we're, we're not submitting to the Son, to Jesus as Lord. Instead, carrying out the passions of our flesh, the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature then children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Children of wrath is that the just response to that would be death, judgment, and God's wrath, not just temporal. Of course, there is temporal wrath, but the also eternal. This is the destiny of it. And verse 4 is an amazing transition, but God. This changes everything. God, being in rich in his mercy, that is his mercy of not giving somebody what they're due, but on the positive side, he did, uh, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, that was the condition. We didn't do anything to improve it. He did this, and this is all of God. He made us alive together with Christ. This is redemption. This is the idea of being sanctified or made holy. It is our union with Christ made to be alive with him. It's called grace. By grace you have been saved. Grace just means an unmerited favor, a gift that he gives. There's nothing which you earn. We are already dead in our trespasses and sin. He unites us and makes us alive together with Christ. And, verse 6, and raised us up, pointing to the resurrection of Christ. Again, what this symbol of baptism does. Yeah, dead, buried, and then what? Raised to walk in newness of life, a new type of life. And then seated us, note here, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Can you, can you catch the connection with crown with glory and honor from Psalm 8 and Hebrews 2? Why did he do that? He did it to display his glory. That's this next phrase. The coming ages he might show the immeasur immeasurable riches of his great. This is the so great salvation. Immeasurable. And it comes through one person. It is the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Summary, by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It isn't a result of works, lest anyone would boast. We're his workmanship, created then in Christ Jesus for good works. It would change the course of your walk, no longer walking towards darkness, but walking in light. And based on that, we should walk in them. He'll say in 5.8, a summary of this, at once you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And the admonition is walk as children of light. This relationship then of being united with Christ, it is accomplished through the sanctification, the being made holy, that the sanctifier, Jesus Christ, accomplishes. And back to our text, he's not ashamed to call us brothers. In fact, it goes on, and here you have a quotation. This is in the voice of Jesus. Verse 12 in Hebrews 2. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And at this point, I invite you to turn to Psalm 22. 
That's where this phrase comes from that Jesus quotes. That said about Jesus, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. It comes from Psalm 22, 22. Now, if you have ever read, thought about, or remember Psalm 22, that should make a big impact in your thinking right now. I want you to draw a cross by Psalm 22. I don't have time to exegete the whole passage. You might want to go back and look at it yourself and compare it to the Gospels and weep. Some people call it the cross psalm. I think you can get it if I just grab a few points along the way from Psalm 22. And this is where I'm getting this idea. It's not so much now in verse 11 and 12 and 13 of Hebrews where, too, where Jesus is um, lifting us up, but this is him lowering himself to be with us forever. This is a messianic psalm. It points to the suffering of Jesus on the cross where he truly did take on human flesh and truly did suffer. And do you remember these words from the Gospels? Look at verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you remember that? Do you see the cross? Do you see the suffering that Christ in his solidarity takes on this wrath for those that he is united with? Drop down to verse 16. For dogs have encompassed me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. This is the Psalms talking about the piercing of the Son, the Messiah. Oh, and if you're not sure, just look at verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Do you remember the story of the cross? Have you seen that? That's the state in which this is. The, the messianic in the sense these things happen to David, but it pointed to a greater happening. It, it pointed to the Messiah. And so here's the prayer in verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword. My life from the power of the dog. Verse 21, save me from the mouth of the lion. And so here is Christ in his praying on behalf of his people in a mediatorial sense for God to save him. He saves him, however, through death and resurrection. And that's this next phrase, you have rescued me. In faith, it points to the resurrection of Christ. And now in this unique state in which Jesus is in, he has suffered and died, tasted death for every son that he will sanctify. And now he has a, a unique solidarity with those that he has sanctified. Verse 22 is where we get the quotation here in Hebrews 2. He says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. I will tell. It is Jesus who discloses the Father to his own. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. Who is that? That would be Jesus. He has made him known. That's how you know about the Father. It is through Jesus. It says he will tell. He is actively engaged in disclosing the Father. And then he is said to be here, verse 22, in the midst of the congregation. Here is a picture of Jesus 
the sanctifier, and those that are made holy, the sanctified, in a mediatorial sense, if you will, in their midst, a solidarity for which he calls them his brothers. The idea of Jesus saying, you're my brother, is an idea of friendship. And by the way, I, I, and I think this is true, I won't be ultra dogmatic, but pretty close. After the, when all of this is accomplished, and Jesus is resurrected, he's in a glorified state, this fulfills this unique union that we have, and unique solidarity, to where now Jesus will call his disciples brothers. A term of great, endearing friendship. If you read through the Gospels, you're not going to hear Jesus refer to his disciples as brothers. Go look it up. You know when you'll hear it? It's after his resurrection. And I think it's purposeful. You can find it in John chapter 20. After his resurrection, he he tells Mary, Mary, quit clinging to me, quit hanging on, but go to my brothers and say to them. Th this is a unique relationship now accomplished by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in this unique state. Now, by the way, it is Jesus that is, this is where I get this from, he's condescending to call those that are in united with him, sanctified, regenerate as brothers. But we don't turn around and call the Lord brother in that sense. Okay? He always remains God. He always remains Lord. I often call, call Jesus Christ, that's his title as Messiah. But just following this, and, and again, save time, you can look it up later, but... Um, in, you probably remember in chapter 20, after this resurrection, he tells Mary to go tell his brothers. Now he calls them. And when he comes to see his brothers in two famous occasions there on that evening, Jesus comes and stands among them. He, he appears in that upper room. And they were glad, the text will say, when they saw the Lord. That's what they call Jesus, the Lord. And most famously, you remember Thomas then, who wasn't there that night at the prayer meeting, but he was the next time, and he wanted to experientially check out all of the evidence, but as soon as he saw Jesus, his response to him is, my Lord and my God. You get my point. It isn't that he's lifting us up to call him, oh, brother Jesus, and be flippant about who he is. And, and there are some who speak that way, I think, out of absolute ignorance. He is always your Lord and God. We confess him as Lord, not brother Jesus. But in his condescension, think of how endearing is he calls you brother, sister. And it is on that basis, him dwelling with us, then he can tell his name to his brothers in the midst of the congregation. And it responds is praise. Seeing that responds in great praise to God, who indeed now in the incarnate Christ, Jesus is dwelling among us and lifts us up in that sense. To be brothers. This is a unique fellowship with him, and that fellowship with him, by the way, is through faith alone. Back to our text. This is the second Old Testament passage. It comes from Isaiah 8, and it could come from a few other places in Scripture because this is a common phrase, but most likely from Isaiah 8. At verse 17, and the next quotation will come from verse 18. Back to our text in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13. He says again, now he's making another comment. He, he already talked about 
the fact of our uh, friendship with him and, and um, now it's fellowship by faith. I will put my trust in him. This comes from Isaiah 8, and if you want to turn there, you can. I'll just mention a couple things about the context of that. But this phrase is taken out of it, talking about hope and trust. In Isaiah 8, 17, you'll have the phrase, I'll, I'll wait for the Lord, and it ends with, I will hope in him. The point of bringing that up is simply that those who have genuine fellowship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord do so because of their faith in him. That's how we have solidarity, through faith. All other ways will create a great stumbling block, if you will. In Isaiah 8, that's the context of it. I'll read it for you if you haven't turned, but if you did, you could look at it yourself. Isaiah 8, 13. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. And again, here's the way we look at God and Jesus. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become, and note these two words, a sanctuary and a stone of offense. And particularly here, he's pointing to Israel who will reject God. On one hand, you have a sanctuary. And the other hand, you have a stone of offense or a stone of stumbling, a rock of stumbling, as it said. A trap and snared inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. It is because of unbelief that, this, that you will not have fellowship with God. Th this is the imagery of the rejection that Israel had on Christ who came as a stone. He was made a chief cornerstone, as the illustration is, or here as a sanctuary. The basis of this sanctuary is a trusting in God by faith. When Jesus says, I will put my trust in him, he's expressing his mediatorial work in identifying with his brothers in friendship with one another and in fellowship with him. It's a life of faith, a life of trust, and a life of belief. Jesus, in his incarnate state, came, took on human flesh, and lived a life of faith. Can I make it simple for you? What's faith? Hebrews chapter 11, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God, so that that which is seen was not made out of things that are visible. You know what faith is? Faith is just belief in God. What objective source can you measure whether you have faith or not? Real simple. What you have in front of you is very word. And Jesus demonstrates this, the founder and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. He demonstrates that in his earthly life. You remember Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is in the wilderness. He's tempted or tested, if you will, by the devil and is proved to be true. But each time in which a temptation is brought to him, do you remember what his response is? It is written, it is written, it is written. His response is he expresses faith in God's word and what God has said. This, this assurance and that this hope, this conviction that we have is expressed in his very word. And the call, beloved, is simply to believe. 
not fellowship with him. It's going to come through belief in all that he has said. It's impossible to please God without faith, Hebrews 11, 6. Even those who died in faith, Hebrews 11, 13, not receiving the actual fulfillment of it, but they believed in God, and therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God by faith. He isn't ashamed to be your God by faith, by believing what he has said. Those that preceded us had many promises about this Messiah who would come. Many things that were to be fulfilled. And God fulfilled them. We're looking on the other side of the cross now, believing and trusting in what he has accomplished and done. But one more thing, in what he said he would do and what he has promised, there are things that are yet to be fulfilled. And to have fellowship with God, true communion with him, <coughs> beloved, it's going to take faith in him believing what he has promised, believing what he has said. I'll try to finish this up quickly because I'll be on vacation next week and I don't want to push this beyond this. So if you bear with me just for a minute, I will, I'll say one more thing. And that is, back to our text, this third quotation, because it comes from Isaiah 8 and verse um, 18. This quotation in verse 14 talks about the very family of God, an intimate connection with him. He says, and, and the, the again here that's mentioned, and again, it's an indicator of another Old Testament quotation. Behold, I and the children God has given me, Hebrews 2, 14. He's speaking about the family that has been given to him. He says, I and the children that you have given me. Jesus explained that in John chapter 17. That people who are sanctified by the sanctifier, these sons that will be brought to glory are gifts of the Father to the Son. They are His children. They are His beloved. John 17, I'll read it for you. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. I understand a lot of people have difficulty in comprehending what we would call the election of God, the, the giving and the choosing. Scripture is very clear about it. Scripture is absolutely clear about it. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you, Ephesians 1. Here this gift is given as a love gift from the very beginning. It was gone to say in John 17, 25, O righteous Father, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you, and these know that you sent me. In other words, they have an expressed faith. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. This expression here in Hebrews about these children of Christ demonstrates the bond of love, this divine love that exceeds anything that you may have experienced. This is a, a love relationship from the beginning of time, from the foundation of the world. It, it isn't a spur of the moment. It isn't this decision ultimately that's based on your decision. It's a decision based on God who grants his grace, who gives his love. 
And that, div- that union then with Christ then makes those that are in relationship to the Father the very beloved. Paul would say in Ephesians, describing this grace, it's glorious in which he has blessed us in the beloved. The beloved is Jesus. He has blessed us there, and that creates a unique intimacy because of his desire to gather his spiritual children. What will he do? Well, the same thing that you do for your loved ones, people you care about, your children. You would give to them as they need. You would guard and protect them as required, and you would provide some sort of guidance and direction, wouldn't it? Th- this, is the, this is the intimacy and tenderness as well as the solidarity that Christ has chosen to do for his children. And I'll finish with this because it's one of my favorite passages. Jesus then would say to you simply this, beloved, if you're in him, sanctified by him, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and will take you to myself. There's the personal intimacy that where I am, there you may be also. And then verse 18 of chapter 14, this phrase, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Let's pray. Father, I pray indeed that we will hear from Christ this day, recognize the, the beauty of his friendship granted to us, our fellowship with him, and are uniting in an eternal family of God through Christ our Lord. I pray this in his name. Amen.